Block 8, Pax Americana, Section 5, Eisenhower's Cold War, with the section, the Suez debacle. In the post-war world, and you can take whole interesting classes on this sort of thing, in the post-war world, uh, in the post-war era, the Arab world uh, is coming to be defined by an era of rising nationalism. Uh, that a combination of, generally speaking, socialist economics and strong feelings of nationalism are transforming the Middle East, um, funded by uh, oil that is being discovered in greater and greater quantities below uh, the surface of the earth, and fan, uh, the flames of nationalism begin to fan the Arab world. Um, the defeat of the Arab countries by Israel in the 1948-1949 war further served to discredit the old monarchies that the European powers had put into place. And in the late 1940s and early 1950s, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, all overthrow their monarchies and are replaced by nationalist leaders, the most important of which being Gamal Nasser, and here he is, here's Nasser, who took control, uh, he overthrew King Farouk uh, in Egypt and took control and ran the country uh, as an autocrat. One of the things that Nasser does uh, to increase his popularity is law now that's coming here. Here's a new map, uh, a map that we should kind of get ourselves comfortable with. Over here is the state of Israel, the Jewish state established in 1947, 1948 against the wishes of all of its Arab neighbors. This here is the Sinai Peninsula. It is part of Egypt. This is the Red Sea. Over here, this is kind of where the Bible says Moses crossed from Egypt into the Promised Land. Uh, but the Sinai is Egyptian territory. Nasser increases his popularity uh, in Egypt by regularly launching raids from the Sinai into Israel, uh, killing settlers, disrupting transportation, uh, attacking outposts, uh, very often. So that's an ongoing source, but that there's not a peace treaty between Israel and any of the Arab countries. There is a ceasefire in place, but that ceasefire is being violated by the raids that Nasser is ordering from the Sinai Peninsula into Israel. A constant low-level uh, series of attacks that are never serious enough to precipitate full-scale war, but is a constant source of annoyance uh, to the Israelis. Now, one of the things that Nasser is trying to do in Egypt is improve the economic standing of his country, and he believes he can do that by damming the Nile River. Nasser wants to build this vast dam uh, downriver on the Nile and use the amount of hydroelectric power that it would produce to bring Egyptians, uh, Egypt's population kind of into the modern world. The United States and Great Britain offered financial help to Nasser, but Nasser decided to play both superpowers against each other. He, he took an offer from the United States and then went to Moscow and saw and went to see if he could get support for the dam uh, for more money, if the Soviets, if he could uh, get a better deal from the Soviet Union. When Nasser openly flirted with the Soviet Union, the British and the Americans withdrew the offer. That Secretary of State Dulles withdrew his offer for foreign aid uh, in exchange for help building these, this dam, um, which did two things. The withdrawal of American assistance really angered Nasser. It drove him into the arms of the Soviets to build the dam, and because the British were also involved, what Nasser did was he took the Suez Canal now, connecting the Red Sea which goes to the Indian Ocean, to the Mediterranean Sea, which goes to the Atlantic Ocean, is this little strip of land. And over this strip of land in the 1840s had been built a canal, the Suez Canal, across Suez, Egypt. And that canal had been built by the British and the French, and 100 years later, in 1956, it was still owned by the British and the French, that the canal zone this canal area was controlled by the British and the French. The canal itself was owned 
by British and French investors. Because Nasser is angry at the United States and Britain, its ally, Nasser moves and he nationalizes the canal. He says, okay, the stockholders in Britain and France who think they own the canal don't own the canal any longer. And now all of those British and French investors are out of their investments. So much of the oil of the Middle East is shipped to Europe through the Suez Canal. So when Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal, this is a potential economic catastrophe for Europe. And because their canal, in their own mind, their canal, had been nationalized, and because the oil supply to Europe was under threat, Britain and France undertake one last colonial action. It will be the last time the British and the French undertake a colonial action on their own. Uh, it will be the last time Britain and France operate without American uh, backing and support. In October of 1956, the British, the French, and the Israelis come up with this cynical plan uh, for the Israelis, what they're going to do, the Israelis are going to uh, stop the Egypt raids from the Sinai into Israel, and the British and the French are going to get their canal back. In October of 1956, Israel attacked Egypt in the Sinai in order to stop these raids. And Israeli forces, uh, regular forces, tanks, troops, you know, artillery, airplanes, advanced all the way up to the canal. The British and French knew the Israelis were going to do this. And as soon as the Israelis reached the canal, the British and the French stepped in. And they said, uh-uh, we are not going to have war on the Suez Canal. We are going to send in our troops to keep the peace. And British and French paratroops paratrooped onto the Suez Canal in order to protect it. In reality, this was a collusion between the Israelis and the British and the French. Uh, the Israelis would take care of their problem, the British and French would take care of their problem, and after a few days of fighting, the world woke up to a British and French uh, airborne army on the canal, and the Israelis sitting on its eastern bank. The British and French miscalculated terribly. They counted on Eisenhower uh, supporting their move, uh, and they counted on the United States to supply Britain and France with oil during this operation uh, because they weren't going to be able to ship any you know, during the conflict itself. But Eisenhower did not support this action. He was afraid that if the United States openly supported it, that Egypt would be openly supported by the Soviet Union. And any time the United States and the Soviet Union are directly involved with each other, the chances for full-scale nuclear war just start to increase. And Eisenhower says the Suez Canal is not worth the superpowers having this terrible conflict. So Eisenhower withholds his support and withholds the oil. The British and the French, embarrassed, let down, angry, disappointed, have no other option but to withdraw from the Suez Canal. Nasser reoccupies it, the nationalization goes through, the Israelis retreat to their border, uh, and everything was as it was at the beginning, with the exception that this proved for the final time that Britain and France were no longer powers able to operate on their own. That Britain and France were not subservient to, but could not operate without the approval of the United States in this Cold War environment. It is also the last time that the United States is able to use oil as a weapon, that as the American economy is growing, the United States is producing less and less of its own oil and is importing more and more oil from foreign places around the world. Eisenhower is unwilling to leave the Middle East to communist influence, and he propagates what's known as the Eisenhower Doctrine after this debacle in the Suez. In 1957, Eisenhower announces what he calls the Eisenhower Doctrine. And Eisenhower promises to support, through military and economic aid, 
Middle Eastern nations threatened by communist aggression. However, Soviet influence in the area is not predicated upon communism itself. That Middle Eastern countries that get support from the Soviet Union, and most of them do, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, uh, get support from the Soviets because of their anti-Western, anti-colonial stance, not because of doctrinaire communists. Uh, communists. That Egypt and Syria, despite being uh, clients of the Soviet Union, do not become communist countries. They merely use Soviet money, Soviet military equipment, Soviet technicians, Soviet experts, uh, for their own nationalist, anti-American, and especially anti-Israeli uh, policies. The oil-producing nations of the Middle East then, recognizing their own growing power, band together uh, and form an organization known as OPEC, uh, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And at the outset, OPEC is made up of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq and Iran and Venezuela. And these countries form together because they have a huge chunk of the world's oil supplies and the modern world runs on oil. These nations come together and form a cartel, a group of countries working together to manipulate the price of world oil. They're going to restrict its flow to make it more expensive, to bring more money into their countries. They're going to regulate its production uh, so that uh, it benefits them and not the people that are buying oil from them. Over the next 20 years, the power of OPEC over the industrialized world becomes immense. That the industrialized world, buying most of its oil from OPEC countries, is utterly dependent on OPEC continuing to produce oil. Now, they're both dependent on each other. Without these industrialized countries buying oil, OPEC is powerless, but OPEC has the power to manipulate that price of oil to really squeeze the industrialized world, and they will certainly do it over the next 20 years, especially in the 1970s. In 1958, the Eisenhower Doctrine is put to the test. Egypt with Soviet encouragement, is trying to overthrow the generally pro-Western government in Lebanon. The president of Le Lebanon is a very unique Middle Eastern country. Um, it has a, it's not a Christian majority, but it is a very large Christian minority in Lebanon. Um, it is not an overwhelmingly Islamic country like most of the countries in the Middle East are. Uh, there is a lot of different sects and groups and religions all operating in Lebanon. And in the 1940s and 50s, they had kind of reached a halfway decent agreement uh, of power sharing between the ethnic and religious groups. And Lebanon, as far as uh, the Middle Eastern countries went, was doing pretty decently politically and economically. Well, the Egyptians try to overthrow that uh, with Soviet backing. They want another client state to the north of the state of Israel. Uh, and there's Egyptian shenanigans going on in Lebanon. The president of Lebanon asks President Eisenhower for aid uh, under the Eisenhower Doctrine. Through very clever diplomacy, able diplomacy, Eisenhower is a born diplomat. He's a much better diplomat than soldier, and he was a good soldier. Uh, and a timely show of American force, the United States landed several thousand troops in Lebanon uh, without a lo loss of life on either side, uh, the Egyptians and the Soviets backed down and order was restored in Lebanon for at least another decade or two. Uh, so the Eisenhower Doctrine, although in general uh, a failure that Egypt and Syria uh, and Iraq and Libya all uh, became client states of the Soviet Union, it did find a degree of success in Lebanon. Middle Eastern policies, we're going to revisit the Middle East uh, many times you know, throughout the rest of the course of this class. But in 1956, you see the, uh, the continuation of a modern Middle East, that the British and the French are now powerless. The United States and the Soviet Union have their own client states. The Arab countries are united in nationalism against the Israelis. And the Israelis look to the Americans 
for support against the Arab countries that are backed by the Soviet Union. There is a war between Israel and Egypt in 1956. There will be two more in 1967 and then 1973 uh, before peace is finally signed between the Israelis and the Egyptians uh, during the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Uh, but that is a story for another day.